Hey everyone, it's Paul Kingsbury, President and National Commander of the Non-Commissioned Officers Association, and welcome to our first episode of our Non-Commissioned Officers Association Versatile Speaker Series. I'd done this kind of in conjunction before with Commander's Call, but uh, talking with our new Chief Advocacy Officer, Mike Little, we decided to split this out as a different line of effort, and I think that was a great recommendation. Um, and the, the intent of this, of this panel specifically is going to be to introduce you to a variety of enlisted Pro professionals, frankly, operating across the spectrum of service, and that could be active duty, National Guard, reserves, retirees, veterans. We're going to get all those perspectives during this, but I want you to learn about current events, challenges, perspectives, and then to highlight the work and accomplishment of enlisted service members. So today for this first episode, uh, it's my pleasure to learn. We've invited a panel of senior enlisted leaders from the newly established Space Command uh, and you know, we're going to learn a little bit about what's going on with Space Command, Space Force, what the difference is, and get, get a sense of the perspective of what's going on um, across that joint force and that combatant command. And then in general, what's the perspective on enlisted issues and things like that and discussions about the Non-Commissioned Officers Association. So um, so let's take some time now to meet our panelists. I'm going to start with uh, Master Gunner Star Sergeant Scott Stalker. He's the Senior Enlisted Leader for Space Command. So Scott, Thanks for joining me today. It's great to see you again. How's everything going with you? Paul, thanks for having us today. Yeah, really, it's going well. Like I told you offline, uh, we had a really nice snow day yesterday, so got about five or six inches of snow. Um, we're, we're moving out. And one of the things I wanted to tell you, you know, is, is uh, we've got some breaking news that I wanted to, to show the team is uh, you'll see this come out publicly tomorrow. This is our commander's strategic vision for United States Space Command. The command here will roll this out. Uh, on our website and on social media so everyone can get a greater understanding of where the boss, where General Dickinson is trying to take us as warfighters in this space warfighting domain. And so joining me today uh, on my right, I've got Chief Master Sergeant Carmen Pogue, who is at the Spacecom uh, J3, J7 SEL, and she's in the United States Space Force. To my left, I've got uh, Chief Master Sergeant John Bentavania, also known as B9. Uh, he is the Space Operations Command Senior Enlisted Leader or uh, Command Chief. Um, and so Spock, and we'll get into it a little bit, is one of the service components of United States Space Command. And then over there to my far left, I've got Sergeant Major Eric McRae, who is the Commandant uh, of, of United States Space Command uh, for United States Space Command and provides a lot of the interaction and engagement for the staff here within the command. So we got a really great uh, team with us today, a diverse team. Uh, and subject matter experts in both leadership and technical abilities in space. So thanks for today. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna like I mentioned before we went live. I'm gonna try to avoid all the you know references to Star Wars and 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 uh, Star Trek and stuff. But you make it hard when you tell me you know right out the gate you know what someone is named nicknamed Spock. You know that's their position. So that's kind of interesting. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, all right. Hey, you know I'll, the big part of this you know, is to inform people and be educational, right? I think NCUA has an educational line of effort, not just on, you know, what's going on with DOD or in certain components of our warfighting mission, but also educational on where the enlisted forces engage and how they're helping contribute to mission um, and basically on the capability. So I'm hoping to touch on all that as we go through. So Scott, could you, you know, let's start with the 101. Why is Spacecom here? And why is this mission to space warfare, I, if that's the right thing to call it, so important? Yeah, thanks, Paul. So, you know, in 2015, um, roughly, that's when we saw both China and Russia create uh, a space organization, a space-like command, a space force specifically devoted to actions in space and capabilities in space. Along with that, uh, in, ma in many areas, they also weaponized it, which made it contentious and no longer uh, free as, as we think of the sea lines of communications. Think of space in that way, where we want to be fair and free for everyone. And so we had Space Command before, but the decision was made in 2002 to, to wrap it up and to roll it up, if you will, because we needed uh, to create U.S. Northern Command. So we created Northern Command, some of that from the people and personnel that we have here. Uh, but in August uh, 29th of 2019, the President of the United States signed a document reestablishing Space Command. And so we, 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 we stood up Space Command. We've been around for about 15 months now really focusing on two things, our warfighters, so our people, and warfighting, 
the, the capabilities both that we deliver to the combat commanders, to the services, but also how we enable war fighting. Uh, if you think of anything you do today, how you're watching this uh, event live, how you're able to check your phone, uh, withdraw money, commerce, anything we do, international trade, uh, global communication, SATCOM, you think of anything, it's all space related. And so in order for us to have uh, to deter our adversary, in order for us to defend our national interests, we're going to have to be able to deter and defend in space uh, and to deliver capabilities if necessary to fight and win. And so really that's a summarization of why we have Space Command. Um, and if, as, if you were to ask a question why we have the United States Space Force, what I think you'll get to, I would, I'd really defer that to my, my teammates in the Space Force. All right, awesome. So yeah, let's jump to that because Scott, you and I did a podcast for the U.S. Naval Institute. We did a proceedings podcast and I kept, not all the time, but I occasionally kept calling you space. Uh, I think I was getting confused between Space Force and Space Com. So I'll open it up to the panelists one-on-one. Let's talk about the differences and how each of you are engaged in this uh, new and growing mission set. And while, and while one of them takes your mask off to talk, I will say you're not the first and not the last uh, to confuse me with that. And that's why this is so important. Hey, uh, so this is B9, so I'll, I'll try to answer that question and kick it over to Carmen if she has additional input. But uh, hey, again, Paul, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to, to kind of be here and, and talk to the audience and all the non-commissioned officer academy individuals who are dialing in today. Uh, so Space Force, why do we have it? So Scott did a really good jo uh, uh, job of talking about you know, space as a warfighter domain, we stood up to combat and command. Um, but because of the warfighter domain, we really looked at the need as an independent service, right, who are the the service organized, train, and equip responsibilities to be able to provide capability to the combatant command to execute that war. The United States Air Force traditionally had the realm of preponderance of uh, uh, developing or organizing and operating a lot of the space systems that we rely on. Not only is, are they reliant upon how we live our lives, uh, but also how we fight our wars every day. Uh, and because of the growing contention we have in space, and we talk about China and Russia, that things are doing to try and take away our uh, asymmetric advantage, uh, the decision was made that we had to have a, a service that was dedicated to growing professionals and then honing the skills to be a good partner with the combatant command as a service, as a service component, to provide those resources and make sure that the command, when you talk about a warfighter domain, had the skills and the depth and experience and expertise they needed to be able to execute successfully. Carmen, I love you. Oh, that's true. I think a big part Paul, is 20 years ago, right, when I started off as a young space operator, space was a benign environment. And so the focus was on peaceful operations. And as our adversaries kind of changed the scope of what we were focused in on and what the true threats were, we needed to focus in and shape how we presented ourselves as a force. And so uh, I think it's been wonderful that B9 and I have been on the forefront of this and making history and being part of that initial cadre of guardians. Um, I also think it's incredibly amazing that here over the next two years, we'll be onboarding additional service members, not just Air Force members. So um, not to steal the, the, the NCOA's thunder here, but right, there will be uh, some additional Facebook and some additional so social media um, uh, input uh, and, and uh, socialization of additional service members coming into the Space Force. So look out for that. Uh, and I think that's going to be really important as we continue to grow and innovate and advance not only the, the guardians that are uh, protecting space, but how we deter and defeat those adversaries out there. Awesome. So, you know, I'm learning about this. Definitely, you know, um, you guys have a lot of experience in this world. You know, I was in the Navy. I was in the Navy nuclear power program. Everything was ship-based. Um, but this world that I've never operated, many people aren't familiar with, can we just, to what you can discuss open source what is the threat do people really understand like why this is so important when you see you know perhaps the chinese shut down or shoot have a capability to shoot down a satellite what what should your average not just service member understand but what's your average american understand about this threat and why we're defending it and deterring in space now i'll take a stab at that and then uh, eric if you have anything to add uh, and so you think of uh, the capability to jam, uh, whether that's from a ground-based system, airborne, uh, the ability to jam our ability to communicate, 
uh, the ability to, to do that to GPS. And so we no longer have the ability to do precision guided munitions, to do any type of navigation, whether that's on air, land or sea. Uh, certainly cyberspace is a, is a growing and emerging threat that continues to evolve. Uh, and that, that could potentially uh, impact our ability to use space-based assets for both you know, uh, the, the global economy, for, for Wall Street, for trade, uh, for communications, any of those things. And so basically, if you think of the goodness and in, in ability that we have, so think of the great things we can do with social media, there's always a bit of negative to it as well. That's the case with all of our capabilities in space. There's a lot of beauty in the fact that we can see, characterize, and understand the entire globe. And so we can predict things with weather. We can provide uh, different things for climate change and, and atmospherics and so on and so forth. But there's also an opportunity for an adversary to get in between that to make sure that we have some bad data as well. And so the threat continues to evolve. Uh, our adversaries, we have seen this, and this is public, where they have uh, launched things and destroyed things in space, which has created space debris. Um, and so you, now you think about not just the environment here, but the space environment. Um, and how are we going to be able to continue to populate space as more and more that gets congested? That's a challenge. That's something that we're focusing on here at Space Command. And certainly the Space Force and the Army provides those forces so that we can keep a track uh, of the threat and we can stay multiple steps ahead of it, not just one step ahead. Okay. Well, excellent. Um, lay down, Scott. You know, truly having the Space Command and, and our warfighting effort just allows us to protect our way of life. And not only ours, but our partners and our allies and friends out there. And having those shared norms and values to operate in space is key and essential to how we move forward in the, in the future in a fast-paced environment that is ever-changing. So that's, that's truly the driver for the need for uh, the Space Command and to include the, the Space Force as a service. All right, awesome. So it's like literally space is the new high ground, right? It's always good to have the high ground. Space is the ultimate at this point high ground, so it's interesting. Um, all right, so for anyone on the panel, um, can you go through and kind of give us a sense of how you're, where are you at in the organizing phase under a space command? You know, how, how is the training? Are we just cannibalizing from the services or certain ratings and things like that? Can someone speak to that? Yeah, I'll touch on that, Paul, since you asked about Spacecom specifically. Um, you probably have seen in the news uh, a decision by our, our previous administration was made to uh, as, as far as a basing decision. Um, and so that is part of the building out of the capacity of the headquarters. And so right now the basing decision is that we will move to Huntsville, Alabama. There has been conversations with the current administration and some of our elected leaders that they may want to take another look at that. Um, that is a political decision. So our elected leaders will make that decision. And as good military service members, we will execute. Um, but what we are on is a plan to continue to build out through the next several FYs um, to get in our capacity. Um, we're, we're growing to roughly a thousand ish people. So you'll have a traditional headquarters with the traditional line and block chart of J staff individuals, uh, heavily populated in, in the J2 and the J3, focusing on intelligence so that we can see, characterize, and understand the adversary, uh, but then operations as well, which is where Carmen is. Uh, so that we can drive the mission uh, and we can send uh, demand signals to our service components and to our functional components, both the Joint Task Force Space Defense here at Schriever Air Force Base or the Combined Force Space Component Command, which is operating at a Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, and so that's kind of a, a, a lay down, but we have not stopped at all. Um, and there's no mission we can't do regardless of where the decision is to, to, to house us as a headquarters. We're, we're provisionally here in Colorado Springs at Peter, Peterson Air Force Base. We're still getting after the mission. We're still pre PCSing individuals in. I see new faces on a daily basis, uh, and we're going to continue to do so until, unless told otherwise. All right. Yeah. So, at, so at the service level, basically, all the components or the subcomponents have—they're already organized, right? You're just the integrator of all that organized force. Is that right? Yeah. Briefly, and then I'll turn it over to, to B9 here. So we do have the Space Force service component. We do have Mar 4 space. We have nav space now. Now, both of the maritime ones uh, are, are multiple headed. So you've got 10th Fleet and, and uh, Fleet Cyber. They're also nav space. And Mar 4 space is also uh, Mar 4 Cyber. And then you have the United States Army Space and Missile Defense Command. You'll notice we don't have the Army piece there. That's a that's a, a conversation we're having with, excuse me, with Air Force leadership 
to bring in an Air Force service component as well. Uh, and then we'll have all of our service components so that they have both the war fighting uh, orders and direction from, from us, uh, but they also have the service standards and the man training equipment piece uh, from the services. And so, B9, I don't know if you want to add on to that. Yeah, so just, you know, the Space Force, we just celebrated our first birthday in December. So we're just, you know, only a year old right now. Um, so from an organization and how we're developing the new service, what it looks like. So uh, as Space Operations Command, that's one of the three field commands that will be within the service. So we'll have overarchingly the leadership that's at the Pentagon at the service level, and then we'll have three independent field commands uh, that are in the service to kind of execute the different um, organized training and equip responsibilities that we have. So Space Operations Command is the warfighting arm, and we are in, in whole, in whole uh, a service component presented to Scott and U.S. Space Command as the Space Force uh, warfighting arm, if you will, to the combatant command. But this summer, you know, the Space Force will be growing uh, uh, as well. Additionally, we're going to have another field command that's going to stand up hopefully in June or July called Space Training and Readiness Command, Star Command. Yes, Star Command in Space Force. Uh, and that is solely going to be focused on, look at, think maybe like the trade-off model that the Army has, where we're going to be looking at how do we develop, train, and hone tactics, techniques, and procedures, all the training, all the things that go behind creating a space warfighter will be executed out of the Space Training and Readiness Command that we hope to stand up in the summer. As well this summer, the third field command will be the Space Systems Command, where they're going to be all the acquisition, all the research and development to create all the capabilities that we plan to put on orbit and also terrestrially to be able to provide that kit to the combatant commands to be able to execute the fight uh, in space. All right, awesome. Um, clearly, this isn't the enlisted force of 1950 and before. So let's talk about that since that's near and dear to our audience heart. Let's talk about how the enlisted force is being utilized. So could, you, could each of you give us some perspective or offer um, what's its capability? How are we utilizing um, across the spectrum and what your observations have been uh, and what you would advocate on their behalf? So Paul, I'll take that one from, from my perspective, right, from the from the operations perspective. I currently have uh, enlisted uh, service members, right, from um, the Army and the Space Force, uh, to include the Air Force as well, sitting down what we have known here uh, at U.S. Space Command as our Joint Operations Center, so our JOC, performing 24-7 operations, giving that global picture, right, that, that picture of what is going on in space back to General Dickinson and back to the National Command Authorities. Um, and so day in and day out, right, it, they, are, they are not just doing executive administrative duties here. They are at the forefront of war fighting operations. Eric? Yeah, Paul, and, and, and um, as, as the commandant here, it's my job to ensure as we bring on our, our service component war fighters that we're plugging them in, allowing them to be fully integrated, as Carmen talked about, the Joint Operations Center, to make sure that they're at the cutting edge of of all the technical um, assets that are out there and they're able to function and, and, and there is no degradation whatsoever. Uh, you, you arrive at the command and you're immediately executing tasks that are, that are vital to our nation's security, again, to our partners and allies as we look at a geographic combatant command. I don't ever look at our enlisted warfighters as you are just enlisted. Um, I look at everybody regardless of age, rank, um, ethnicity, where they're coming from. They have something to innovate, advance, and, and leave it better than how they found it here at, at not only this combatant command, but for their service, especially as a joint um, space warfighter. And so that is really important that we embrace that culture and, and that identity of every enlisted professional that walks through, uh, through these command doors. Hey, Paul, what I'll... I'll uh say is I just did some traveling with the boss with General Dickinson recently and every organization we went to and predominantly for this visit was with the Space Force and their Deltas. They had enlisted members brief in the four star, not because this was an opportunity to practice in front of a four star because they were the subject matter expert. They were the person that knew the trade craft. They intimately were working that problem set, whether it was focusing on uh, orbital warfare, uh, or GPS or whatever the case, SATCOM, you name it, they understood what was going on. Now, what we've got to do is set the conditions, and I, and I think we're doing this fairly well, but we've got to continue to focusing on this, is so that that E5, E6, or whatever the case may be, doesn't just do that for 25 or 30 years. 
they do a little bit of that. And the next assignment, maybe they're working cyber. Uh, maybe they go from there and they're working with the United States Navy. But there is some kind of career track and model so that they get a little bit more. And so at a certain point, they are understanding and they're at the E9, they understand all domain warfare. And this morning I joined General Dickinson as we spoke for two hours with the Marine Corps War College, uh, predominantly Marine officers, but there was Navy, Air Force, civilians, and Army there as well. And what I was really proud about is I knew that there were several enlisted we have here in the building, um, and, and maybe even myself, uh, that was able that would have been able to easily give that brief and have that conversation and know exactly what he was talking about. Um, so we hold professionalization events here. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Carmen and I are moving out quickly. Well, we're going to go uh, spend some time with Air University, with TRADOC, with the Sergeant Majors Academy, with the Navy Senior Enlisted Academy, so that we take a lot of this space warfighting curriculum and we offer it up to the services and provide it to the joint force. So at every echelon that they move up in pay grade, they understand how space impacts all domain warfighting. All right. Got it. Um, let's get this. Uh, let's kind of change up a little bit, get a little broader. So. You know, obviously one of the lines of effort non-commissioned office association does, there's an advocacy line, government affairs, and that's, we just hired a new chief advocacy officer, Mike Little, and we help tell a story to Congress and other decision makers and leaders <clears throat> about challenges, concerns, what they like, what they don't, right? So we help tell a story. Um, so I kind of want to get your perspective. You know, I retired two years ago. I know it was on my mind, but that can quickly become irrelevant. So I think it's important and NCUA stays connected to today's senior enlisted leaders and gets a sense of what are you guys hearing from the force across? It could be service, it could be joint, but what's on their mind? Is it pay? Is it benefits? Is it op tempo? Is it training? Do they need more resources? Are there cultural issues? So for each panelist, what's your biggest concern that you advocate for and that we could help, frankly, as NCUA? And then what's the biggest thing that you hear that people – um, like about being in the services? Real quick, and then I'll, I'll ask everyone to chime in. Uh, COVID has presented opportunities, but also some challenges. And one of my greatest concerns is for dual military and single, uh, single spouses with kids, uh, because a lot of the CDCs are not open. Um, and so, Paul, when you mentioned the legis legislative advocacy, that's the first thing I wrote down that I wanted to talk about with NCOA. That's where we would love to see NCOA advocate a little bit more we need opportunities for, for single parents, for dual military, um, because the demand here is not going to die. It's only going to get greater. But if my, my workforce, my teammates, uh, some that work directly for me, can't put their kids in child care and they've got to decide if the husband or the wife goes to work that day uh, or, you know, uh, whatever the, the gender is of the, of the marriage, um, then they've got to make a hard decision that, that is not fair to them. Um, and so how does the mission suffer? So where we need more support is in that area and then mental health as well. And I'll leave it at that and, and let the team chime in. Yeah, so I'll jump in next. And uh, Scott, I agree. I think that, you know, the, the, the COVID challenges that we've gone through as services, as a, as a DOD uh, over, the, over the past almost year now um, has really shown, hey, where is it that we really shine? Where we do really well? And some of the challenges that we have, um, you know, in, in exact discussion you've talked about, whether it be mill to mill or just the, the, the other uh, parent, the other the spouse, uh, had, a, had a job they had to get to. We had a lot of service members that their spouses were in healthcare, right? They had to go to work and the children were out of school. And I think, Paul, you would ask, hey, what, what some of our, our uh, junior enlisted, what if our enlisted appreciate and, and why they enjoy uh, being serving in uniform? I think we did a really good job of trying to figure out, hey, how, what are the mission essential tasks we have to do to execute the mission to keep it going through COVID? But the flexibility that we were able to employ with all of our members where, hey, if you needed to telework, you needed to, to work odd hours to kind of work and coordinate with your significant other to kind of make sure that family members and children were taken care of, I think was a really strong benefit. It really showed the connection and the family community we have uh, as services. So we have to make sure that, like Scott said, that those resources to kind of help those family members continue taking care of one another and continue that sense of community from the DOD is really important. We need advocacy on the Hill to make sure that uh, money and resources are spent on that. Uh, one of the things I would say when we talk about advocacy that I really appreciate it, and I think it's already something that in the resolutions that NCOA has out for the 2021 uh, year is 
you know, the president and Congress, when they talk about where they're going to invest and spend money, they put panels together, you know, retired officers, subject matter experts, senior civilians in their fields. And I think one of the efforts that you have is that we have to have qualified, mature, senior enlisted representation on those presidential and congressional panels to make sure that the needs and requirements that we have, in addition to all of the good work you're doing representing us on the Hill, but they're also sitting around the table with these panels to make sure that our needs and our desires are being heard so that when legislation is being written, we're not forgotten about. Oh, I, I, I like to kind of go back to something that Scott added, and he's talked about the behavioral health aspect. So when we talk about services uh, being available for our warfighters to, and by and large, let me just tell you, we have a great group of men and women who have chosen to raise their hand and serve our, our nation. And uh, we do them a disservice when we don't have those opportunities out there for them or those resources for them to plug into. We know that we live in a very competitive and congested environment when we talk about great power competition. And we see on the horizon that some of our high rock tempo things won't change. So how do we combat that? How do we recognize the physical, the mental, uh, the family dynamic, the financial, you name it, you throw it in that pool. How do we protect that warfighter? Or when that warfighter recognizes that he or she is uh, having some, some impairments, if you will, that they can come to their leaders and know that their leaders can, can direct them to services uh, that, are, that are going to be right there to take care of them. So uh, your advocation, your team's advocation for the resources to be to have more of the behavioral health assessment teams and, and those assets uh, available to us uh, will be uh, greatly a, a, a big impact to the force. And as we continue to talk about those behavioral behavioral um, mental health uh, issues and help I think we also need to focus in on, um, and I'm going to speak as a woman here into the rest of the counterparts. As we look at those medical, uh, the medical professionals that can help with those those families that are struggling, that do have the issues when it comes to um, things that Tricare doesn't recognize, like infertility and IUI and IVF, uh, in helping parents navigate those waters through adoption. Um, I know that we have put a lot of uh, legislative processes in place, especially through the Air Force and Space Force. Uh, to kind of stabilize a lot of those things for our airmen and guardians. Uh, I'd like to see that that aperture broadened out more to, to all, um, all the enlisted across all the DOD, um, right? It, it shouldn't just be isolated to one service, and that's where a big part of the NCOA helps advocate for everybody on that, Paul. So continuing down that road of not only from the, from the mental health aspect, but from that um, we are a family, and we need to take care of our own sometimes when they are struggling with those family issues. All right, awesome. That's great feedback. Um, you guys touched on a lot there. Uh, and I think that's where NCOA comes in, right? It's not just getting up in front of legislative affairs and talking about budget, and we will continue to do that. But it's, I think for most part, right, when I at least, you know, I'm, I'm relatively recently retired, and I think these things are there. I didn't hear a lot about pay and benefits, and we weren't getting enough. It was don't let them take it away. So I think we consistently advocate, because when you're in a time of austerity and budget, um, issues. There's a temptation to want to take things away. And you guys all know, right, we're talking about everything from commissary to depend, you know, dual BAH and all those things. So we'll stay informed on that. But these things that you bring up are cu crucial. You help inform us uh, and keep us informed on the issues that are relevant. And we'll help dial that voice up and work in concert. And I think there's a space where we can talk a little more aggressively than a senior enlisted on active duty. Not that they don't do it, but there's things that we do, there's access we can get, and working with Mike Little, our chief advocacy officer, you know, we're proud to represent and move forward on those things. So, um, so there's a, you know, I know we talked, uh, you know, we talked about COVID in general. Um, I know that's going on. I think the vaccine's rolling out. I think that's kind of getting there. And hopefully this year we move past that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, this panel shows force of diversity. I think on the enlisted side, you know, when you look at how we've become more diverse as a as DOD and service, um, I think for the most part we're there. When you look at the officer corps, I think they they have challenges. But what's each of your perspectives on how where we're at with force diversity? 
Are we leveraging the talent that's there or are there still things that are getting in the way that are holding us back that uh, we need to do to move forward? I'll make three quick points, Paul. Um, so you talked to, I want to go back real quick to that previous subject. Um, you know, the book legacy is something that I've been preaching about uh, quite often. So the enlisted members, uh, all of us are going to accept more pay if more pay is available. Uh, no one's turning that down. But, but why people stay is because we actually show through our actions that we care. And that's really highlighted in that book, Legacy, where you have the New Zealand All Blacks, a lot of extreme athletes that are extremely talented that have the opportunity to do multiple other things. They stay with the All Blacks because the leadership and the management show through their actions that they love and care for the entirety of their family and the individual. And so they stay forever. That's kind of like you, you join as, a, as an individual, but you re-enlist as a family. Uh, the other bit on COVID you talked about a moment ago. So I'm fully vaccinated now. I've gotten both shots. Some of my teammates have been sh uh, getting the shot here as well. Feel great. Uh, quite frankly, why do we get the shot? Um, I personally would have been fine, I think, if I had COVID or not. But I get the shot because I care about others more than myself. And so that gets back to service before self and why we do certain things, okay? Um, and so I actually forgot what the question was now. I was going so far. Um, diversity, diversity inclusion. Thank you. Uh, a critical topic here. Um, and, and obviously, you can see we're, we're doing uh, fairly well here. We've got more to do. We've got more work to do. What I'm focusing on here um, as, as a combat command CSO is making sure the folks that I do get in get an opportunity. There is no shortage of opportunities for a male, female, black, white. You pick your gender, um, any of that to, to succeed at Space Command because we have more opportunities than they can handle. So all of that's there. I concur with your comment. I think that the officers can probably do a little bit better, but also we need to look in the mirror and see where we can do better as well. And I'll, and I'll uh, leave it there if anyone else has something to add on that. Sorry, 20 years ago, Paul, I think when I came in, um, it was rare for me to see a female senior enlisted leader. And I think now is, is through the last two decades of, of wearing this uniform and coming through, um, seeing young airmen and young guardians they don't have to question that anymore because the the Air Force and the Space Force have done such a wonderful job with that. Um, how the Air Force, you know, just put Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Joe Bass, as, as a first female, right? Uh, senior um, service uh, enlisted leader. And that is astounding. That, that was big. Uh, and I think for the force to see that, right? It's not just about our gender and, and who we are and where we're sitting. It's about how are we elevating and how are we as senior enlisted leaders um, bringing those up behind us to replace us, right? And how are we leaving things better than how we found them for our teammates? Um, and so that's a big part of it. It's not just who you are, where you came from, uh, the color of your skin, your gender, but what are you doing for your team? So um, from the Department of the Air Force level, right? So, you know, the, the United States Air Force and the United States Space Force are still under the Department of the Air Force. You know, we uh, recently put out a report um, on the disparity, right, that we had uh, in the service through processes and, and, and programs. And when you look at uh, opportunities to go to school and discipline, um, that there's, there's there's a disparity there that we need to address. And that's the next phase we're going into is is looking at, okay, so we know what the data tells us that there's a disparity. Now we really got to back and we got to do the homework and we really got to dig deep and find, okay, why do these disparities exist? Um, so that's an ongoing process. For me, you know, General Whiting and I, uh, from the command, when we engage uh, with with our with our lower echelon commanders and our guardians and airmen that are in the command, you know, this this is an everyday effort. This isn't going to be one big program that comes out of the service. You know, a policy letter written by a senior leader is not going to get after this, right? We talk about diversity inclusion, how critical it is, but it has got to be an everyday effort for us as serve as as senior leaders and as services to make sure that we're looking at this every day. And making sure that you know the things that we the things that we do the processes that we have uh, we have to make sure we're looking at them through different lenses to say hey you know are, are there any any unintended barriers or limitations that we're placing on individuals um, because of the way we thought because of the way we think and you have that whether you know your age your race the functional community that you grew up you know i'm sure you know, you know right i'm sure submariners think of a certain way right and 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 other individuals in the Navy think a different way because we have those functional stovepipes. We've got to break down those barriers uh, within the way we think and the process that we have to make sure that, as Scott said, right, that 
Opportunity is boundless. Everyone has to have the opportunity to be the best versions of themselves. And we have got to make sure that we as senior leaders make sure that we are helping each and every service member help them achieve the best version they have without putting any barriers in front of them. But it's got to be, it's an everyday challenge. You've got to think about everything you're doing. Um, and I, I, you know, the dialogue we've had over the, almost the past year, from my personal perspective, uh, has helped me grow immensely uh, and just be a better be a better person, be a better man, be a better leader. And I'm thankful for the for the discussions that we're having on especially specifically diversity and inclusion. Paul, oh, I would I would also tell you when we start talking about diversity and inclusion, uh, and this kind of gets back to uh, Scott's point of how we're going out and and developing our PME and making sure that as leaders. We, we need to continue to evolve and educate ourselves so we can understand where those biases are, if there are any, and then also be able to uh, go about and implement change to make sure that we're given those opportunities for the service member, regardless of gender, race, creed, or any of those things. So we're recognizing the talent that's in there, because at the end of the day, the talent is what's going to save us. Uh, we, can, we can have all manner of systems, but if we aren't giving uh, our great warriors our servicemen and women an opportunity to uh, learn and grow and to be able to show us all the, the, the talents that they have, we're, we're really going to miss the mark and we're not going to be there when the nation calls us. And that, that's not what we do uh, as, as our service component and especially at uh, United States Space Command. We're about making the right choices, doing the right things, recognizing the right people irregardless and putting them in the right places to, to have great actions on contacts is going to yield great benefits for the team. Hey, Paul, real quick, if I may, on this subject, because uh, this is passionate, a passion of mine. Um, you know, at the end of the day, this is about war fighting and lethality. Uh, and so when I had the conversation with the senior enlisted advisor to the Space Force to fill the J3 SEL piece, what I didn't say is, hey, I need, another, I need a woman, uh, I needed this. I said I needed the, the most qualified and capable individual, standards-based. So whether it's Ranger School, uh, whether it's, you know, boot camp, whether it's, you know, special forces qualification to join the Space Force, it's all standards-based. Um, and someone we mentioned earlier, you know, a chief master on the Air Force, Joe Bass, um, she was the best talent and the right talent and the best qualified individual. It wasn't, hey, we got to take a step down and, and finally bring a woman in. Um, that board was above board. Uh, we bring in the best talent, they interview, and the right person was selected then, and we got the best talent in this time as well. And so that's what it's all about. Is, is having standards, enforcing standards, and then making sure others get an opportunity. As my old boss, Lieutenant General Stewart, once said to me, just make sure you give someone an opportunity who doesn't look like you. And that's all we do is we give them an opportunity, we coach, teach, and mentor them along the way, and then we, we pick the right person, uh, the right individual, if you will. And so I'm, I'm confident that we are doing that. I also know, based on the feedback and reports that I've read throughout the department, that we gotta continue to emphasize this and to continue to get better. All right, let's shift gears. So I think, I, well, I think, I know I asked you guys before we started who had heard of NCOA during their career, all the hands went up and all the hands went up and said they were members. So that's great. You know, one of the, you know, one of my lines of effort is to raise awareness. You know, we're trying to build membership and we're trying to ensure NCOA remains relevant, uh, frankly, in a digital age and with a new generation of active duty service members. So we have, huge constituency right across a variety of things so we've got retirees veterans we got national guard we've got reserves we got active duty of all kinds of services so you can see it gets really complicated so i'm definitely trying to raise awareness with the enlisted force on active duty of what ncoa is and not just us but what organizations like us do whether it's the you know, air force sergeants association a chief petty officer association what have you uh, you know an aviation boatswain mate association um these things have value, but I found my time on active duty, a lot of people didn't come talk to me about why they're important and what the value of that is. So I want to ask each of you, you know, what's your experience been with NCUA and why do you think these organizations are important and what value they bring to the active duty service member? Yeah, so I'll start on that. And uh, so Paul, just so you know, um, you know, I was, a, I was an NCUA uh, member and you know, prior, just getting ready for this, I realized that my membership had lapsed. So I renewed yesterday. So your drive to a thousand new members uh, come one July. Hopefully that's, I don't know if it counts, I'm coming back, but hopefully that's down by one. I'm getting closer to your goal to hit that in July. 
Um, so why is NCOA uh, important? I would say to you, um, you know, when we talk about, especially as serving military members in the Department of Defense, not only ourselves, but our family members, and the criticality, right, how important it is when we talk about what our elected officials, what goes on in Washington, um, and having someone as like an organization, I know you're part of the, the military coalition, I believe, uh, with other organizations that advocate, uh, but having people who are focused, connected, and, and, and have the ability on a daily basis to advocate and represent us on Capitol Hill with our elected officials to make sure that we and our families are taken care of is so important, right? Because we're still in uniform, we're fighting the fight, but we have got to make sure that we support and join organizations like NCOA, NCOA, so you have the power, right, the push behind you, the relevance um, to be able to, when you're on Capitol Hill, represent us, hear what we're saying, take our concerns, and make sure they're being represented, because that is critically important. And that's not only for our time while in uniform, but as you know, these are things that are carry on to us as we retire and or separate from, from service, and, and though still what happens in Washington, D.C. will have a lasting impact on ourselves and our families. And I just want to thank you because it's so critically important what you're doing in our part is we got to make sure we're, we're, we're supporting you, part of the organization. So when you go there, you have the, the advocacy and you have the power to get things done. Paul, I will tell you, I'll give you a, a true story here. There was about 2013-ish uh, or so, don't hold me to it, uh, but I was in the Sitcom Theater of Operation. And uh, prior to going, I joined a, joined a command and the sergeant major down there at the time, the command sergeant major, was very adamant about, hey, we would need to get our membership up for the NCOA, and, and we we're working extremely hard to do that, and I think we did extremely well. Uh, unbeknownst to us that while we were down there about five and a half months in our 12-month deployment, uh, there became some rumor that was out there about some of the, the tuition assistant was going to change. Obviously, we kind of have a routine of some of the things that we do out there, but it does provide an opportunity for our warriors to uh, to participate in some of the services that was being offered by the naval naval team out there. So um, as we as we the months got closer, then we realized that there really was going to be a, a cut in the in the funding there. Your team's advocation was was important. We went back, we made some calls between the sergeant major and the commander, and before you know it, before our tour of duty was over, we had no lapse in, in the educational benefits that were there. Uh, the warriors were, were reimbursed, reimbursed for all the things that they were out of pocket, and that was just a, a, just a, a cementing point for them to know that, hey, we have advocates out there that are always looking out for our best best interests, even when we're out performing our missions and duties, and, and i like to thank your team for that. Uh, I know there are quite a few that may not have been a part of that, but the fact of the matter that we have an agency that can do that for us is, is phenomenal. So, Paul, is coming off a, a dual military couple here, my husband just retired this last year, and coming into play, what your organization does now for him as a veteran um, is resounding. I mean, it goes, uh, thank you isn't enough for what NCOA does now for my husband as a retiree as a veteran. And so as I transition into, you know, that role as a veteran, um, a couple of years from now, right, I know what your organization not only brings to me wearing the uniform right now, but what it's doing for my husband, um, what it's doing for my father-in-law who served. I like to tell my teammates, right, we all wear two name tags on our uniform, one with our family name and one with the family name that we all raise our right hand for. And the wonderful part is that when we take this uniform off, we have a family like NCOA to continue to be there for us. So thank you, Paul. Thank you to the NCOA for everything that this wonderful organization does for our families. Hey, Paul, the team really hit on it. So what I would do is, is flip it a little bit and say, uh, well, first off, uh, not a couple more years for Carmen. She's got 10 more to go. Um, <laughs> um, we're going to hold on to her forever. But but in all seriousness is, um, you know, looking at, it, at who you've got working there is, is uh, the opportunity to, to really evolve in this information space so that we can get those 1,000 extra members or 10,000 extra members, but we've got to go where they are. Uh, and whether those are younger veterans who may be into esports and video games, uh, we've got to target that audience in the places that they're at. And so I, I always tell people that if you look at who's on your board and who's doing a lot of the work, um, at some point you probably want to get some, some youth in there as well uh, and, some, and some really good, strong public affairs because that's how we can get the message out about all the greatness you've heard about it in combat, 
Uh, you heard about it for a, a retiree perspective, uh, all of the above. And I really, really appreciate the legislative advocacy that you guys bring to that, because that's something that I don't have on a daily basis. I, I certainly can can reach out and touch my my, leg, my elected officials, and I have engagements with them. But you guys have a direct line uh, that can speak for us directly. And so I appreciate that. I think we just got to look at how we're targeting the audience and, and where they're at. All right, that's great feedback. I appreciate those insights. Um, yeah, that advocacy thing has historically been our strong point and it's definitely what our members want, but we also do a lot of other things, right? There's several give back programs. You've seen scrolled at the bottom of the page that we've got our NCOA scholarship fund. Um, you know, that's been going on. We've given out a lot of money to over 2000 member dependents or spouses, uh, since that's been established. So we have the scholarship program, we got the Betsy Ross fund, we have a disaster relief fund. So these are just other ways we try to give back to our members and our listed force. But to, you know, for most of those to be a benefit, you got to be a member. So I appreciate your guys insight on that. Um, all right. So let's wrap it up here. We're getting uh, close to an hour and I know I don't want to lose people. So across the panel, any last closing thoughts on Space Force, whatever you want to say, it's over to you guys. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of this, um, for us to speak a little bit about not only what U.S. Space Command is doing, but right what each one of us is doing within our own service components um, to provide back to that to that space domain uh, as, as a joint war, joint space warfighter. Um, it's refreshing to be able to share our stories, uh, and hopefully it resonates with somebody out there. Um, so thank you very much. And April, again, uh, thanks to you and uh, NCOA for, for this opportunity to, to kind of chat and talk about a few things. Um, I would say just from a Space Force perspective, man, it is an exciting time, right? Setting up a brand new service, just a little over a year old. Um, we're getting the chance with uh, with the guidance and leadership of uh, Chief Master Rick Toberman, and especially on the enlisted front, right? What does it mean to be enlisted in the Space Force? We're taking, looking at it from a different prism. Um, from a brand new service, a technological mission focused service. So it's an exciting time to, to, to be here. Uh, you know, right now we're really preponderance of airmen that made the transfer, but we're really looking forward to having other service members from the, the Army and the Navy and the Marine Corps uh, come over and join the service and, and become guardians with us. But really more importantly for this larger audience is we are really looking forward to being great teammates and joint partners with all the other services as we develop our capabilities and our war fighting ethos. I'm looking forward to it. Paul, I'd like to say uh, thank you to you and your team for assembling this panel and, and having our senior enlisted leader and uh, him given, extending the privilege for all of our services to be represented here today. I will just tell you that the warriors here at the United States Space Command stand ready on watch to make sure that we don't have a day without space. And, and how we do that is through the great American uh, young men and women, our lifeblood that are out there that are serving hard every day. And we can't thank them enough. And it's an honor to be on this panel and uh, get an opportunity to speak with our audience today. Paul, thanks again. Uh, yesterday was National Spouses Day. Um, and so let me say uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart to those spouses who uh, do so much for us. And I mean that sincerely. Uh, I, I would not be here without my spouse. I would not be... Uh, anywhere at this level of success without my spouse. Um, not just the ability to, to take care of, uh, of my, my two daughters that are at home, uh, my little Olive and Grace, but, uh, but also all of the things that we've got going on as I'm traveling, working late nights, I'm, I'm almost finished with my second graduate degree. So many things that we're trying to pursue. And so to all the spouses out there, uh, happy uh, and, and thank you. Uh, let, me, let me address the non-commissioned officers, the petty officers that may be listening today. Um, Scott Stalker, as a young PFC, was assigned to the absolute worst staff sergeant in the Marine Corps, by far. Uh, this individual hated his spouse so much that we worked all the weekends. Uh, this individual really uh, had uh, every nickname in the books you can think of for me uh, that would be extreme adjectives that I wouldn't be able to use today uh, online. Um, you, have, you have options in life, and certainly I was leaning towards getting out of the Corps until I uh, spent some time with then a guy named Chris McEntee and Bob Howard who raised me as a good NCO. Um, and so my message to the NCOs out there today is there will be times where you work for jerks uh, and, and really poor leaderships. Uh, drive through that, work as best you can, 
continue to, to do your best, to continue to seek opportunities. Uh, that is a brief assignment in time. I've now been in 28 years. That was a three-year tour. Um, and quite frankly, what I did is I just tried to outwork him. I tried to become better. And so that the commander, the sergeant major there would lean on me for more and more and more. Um, that's going to happen from occasion, uh, from time to time. What we are trying to foster here at United States Space Command, and I, and I echo uh, B-9's comment there, this is an exciting time to be in the space enterprise. My entire goal here at United States Space Command is to make us the envy of the Department of Defense. And we're doing that by making sure I genuinely love and care for my people, uh, our people, our families, um, and, and we hold them accountable. We work them hard. We set them to standards. Uh, and then we give them opportunities to, to shine. Um, and I think as you continue to do that, you get more and more phone calls. And matter of fact, I was talking offline with B9 earlier. I've got more phone calls of people wanting to come here than I actually have billet space. That's a positive thing. That's a good thing to have. Um, and so for the NCOs that are listening today, keep driving, keep working hard, whether you do four years or 40, God bless you. Thank you and Semper Fidelis and Semper Super. That's right. All right. Thanks for that wrap up. Uh, on that note, uh, I was, you know, you mentioned about uh, spouse appreciation. We do have an auxiliary, non-commissioned officer associate auxiliary. You can check that out. That uh, that membership's open to spouse, family members of, of non-commissioned officer um, members. So check that out, www.ncoa.org and get some information and consider joining us there. So, all right. This has been a great discussion, I think. I think uh, it's been informative. We've gotten some great comments on the side. I should have had those teed up and uh, saying that, but we've got some faith or some feedback from our Facebook users. The feedback looks good and we'll continue to do this as we move forward. So my guest today, Master Gunnery Sergeant Scott, Scott Stalker, Chief Master Sergeant Carmen Monique Pogue, Sergeant Major Eric McRae, and Chief Master Sergeant John Bentevania, all working hard to make sure that Space Command is prepared to deter and if they need to, to fight and win in that new war fighting domain. I hope you guys have found this informative. I have. Uh, before I close it out, I want to thank, say thanks to Mass Sergeant Beth Gidry. Um, she did a lot of work on the backside. Great, great person. I haven't even met her in person, but lots of energy. She did, you know, lots of that great attitude, and she did a lot to make this uh, all come together on that side. So, Beth, thanks for your help with this. Uh, thanks to our panelists for your time. I'm definitely impressed. I'm proud of you guys, and let's make uh, sure we keep in touch through NCUA and on and offline. So good luck to you guys and thanks for joining us.